great. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and um, with so many of you that share my passion, which is digital healthcare. I know that a few of you probably had a higher level of passion five years ago and are currently wondering why is it taking so long? All the great technologies out there, why aren't we implementing it any quicker? And that was actually the fundamental question behind one of these pieces of work that McKinsey did, um, which I led, which was to create the kind of incentive and business case for um, digital health on a broader national level. Now, be rest assured, there will be a breakthrough in healthcare, the biggest one um, for probably ever within the next decade. We fundamentally believe that because of three very important reasons all coinciding. The first is we simply cannot continue as is. Um, the healthcare costs are increasing exponentially in all of the developed countries. We, in Finland, we stand to go from 10% of GDP to 12% of GDP within by 2030 at latest. And that may not seem like a lot of money. 20, um, it's 10 to 12, that's 2% of GDP. Just to put that into context, that's as much as we spend on all of our education and universities today. So, healthcare is extremely expensive. The second thing is um, we have, fortunately, technology that can help us. There is a breakthrough, exponential breakthrough, in medtech, in genetics, in um, biotechnology, medicine in general, which will help us to address this challenge. And finally, we have very, very demanding patients that want to be a bigger part of their own care and are willing to step up and take some of this responsibility. You may wonder why I chose this picture in the background. Does anyone want to guess? Does anybody want to guess what's special about who we have here? Any doctors in the room? So, um, what is special is the pink stethoscope hanging off this doctor whose name is Tarek Lubami. Now, do you want to guess what's special about this stethoscope? Okay. <laughs> What is special is that it's 3D printed. And um, it was developed uh, when he had experience working in Gaza after a severe supply limitations and having to share stethoscope with all the doctors there. When he came back to Canada, he developed this innovation. This stethoscope costs $2 to make, as opposed to $200, which a premium stethoscope costs. And um, that's just one illustration of the technology being there, but also being exponentially more affordable, available to the, to the industry. When working in digital health, we find ourselves kind of everybody coming from it from different perspectives. You know, what is digital health? Is it AI? Is it doctor consultations? Is it handling big data? We've um, addressed all of that in our research. So just a quick recap of what digital health actually can mean and what is already out there technically. One extremely important part of it is what we can do with sensors, what sensors enables us to do in preventive and predictive healthcare. We avoid being sick, and if we are sick, we're better at managing our chronic conditions. Uh, sensors like tattoos, temporary tattoos, like lenses being patented, and um, applied then the patient being in charge of their own disease, their own chronic illness, or, when necessary, this information being transferred and integrated with uh, the provider's information. Today, the platform is um, our mobile phone and the almighty apps that it holds. In the future, probably voice-assisted uh, consoles like Alexa, which we, of course, know are a couple of generations away from being truly valuable in this sense, but still very much coming. And 
there we go. Another way is how healthcare will be delivered. It will be increasingly delivered through non-traditional channel. That's not to say that we're not going to have doctors and nurses. We are going to have doctors and nurses. We just simply can't have an exponential number of doctors and nurses taking care of us. So we need new tools, such as digital consultations over uh, video, but also over chat messaging. Um, there are uses for robots, such as Pepper. Has anybody met the robot Pepper there in the picture? She's adorable, isn't she? It's very, it's a very, very... You understand it's a, it's a robot, but when you meet Pepper, you feel like you're connecting. There are fantastic uses for uh, these type of service, companion robots. And, of course, drones delivering medical equipment, but all kinds of other situations as well. And the final area that's part of our work is um, the combination of genomics, uh, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, um, when bringing all of that together, it allows for precision medicine, it allows for us to cure previously incurable diseases, it may even eradicate some of the most devastating diseases we have. So this is an exciting time from a technology point of view. In our work, what we looked at, we grouped these technologies and then we said, let's take all the research out there, uh, which is something that McKinsey has the capacity to do. So we collected the 500 most prominent research publications and uh, papers and case studies of existing technologies that had already proven efficacy, that had in some, some setting, some real life care setting, proven to be efficient. And they are the 14 technologies there, grouped according to connectivity, which is primarily um, something patient-facing, so the patient's way to interact with medical facilities and, and their health. Automation, primarily the backbone, the background, how information flows between the different departments of the caregivers. And finally, advanced analytics, um, so artificial intelligence is the buzzword, but mostly it's about cl clinical uh, consistency and uh, information availability, precision medicine and, and um, decision support. And all of these technologies have a range of benefits for patients, providers and payers. They align the incentives. It's a win-win-win situation in many of these cases. And what we calculated on is the, sa the savings that we, as a society, on a national level, can make in terms of less missed uh, appointments, in terms of doing the right thing immediately, not having the wrong diagnostics or the wrong treatment, which means readmissions, which may mean long, prolonged, unnecessary care paths. Um, using old medical evidence when newer is available, etc. So these are quality savings that then translate into a very real quantitative saving. I don't know where to point this. <laughs> oh, that's too much. There we go. And when applying this technology to Sweden, uh, this uh, methodology to Sweden, we looked at um, what the baseline is in Sweden in adopting these different 14 existing different technologies on the Swedish cost uh, care baseline and um, projecting the type of savings that we could count from these technologies in 2025, which incidentally is the year where Sweden has said that they're going to be the best in the world in e-health. I don't know if somebody wants to challenge that, but that is the ambition of the government. And um, seeing what the estimated gross savings could be from all of these qualitative and quantitative uh, values. And that's quite a lot of, of savings potential, 180 billion Swedish kroners, 18 billion euros. 
if everything is implemented that's already there and works across the Swedish healthcare system within the next 10 years. You could say that that's um, possible to extend to Finland. We should probably do a more accurate calculation, but if we would just look to the volume and the budgets, it would be in the range of 8-9 billion euros in Finland three times what the government is looking to save in terms of SOTE. So, predictably, this is um, rather a, a large incentive to get this to work and to work together. As you can see, we do think that um, the different, 14 different uh, technologies, none of them is you know, doing it all by themselves. There are many different ways of achieving real value in healthcare. As I mentioned before, remote monitoring and connected sensor is a really big potential. All the, all the things that have to do with direct connection with the patient and their professions, for example, through digital consultations, etc., that's quite easy to achieve. That's about me as a patient using tools already available there to manage my disease and to communicate effectively with care we can do most of these things immediately. There's nothing stopping us. When it comes to automation and everything that's kind of behind the scenes about integrating data, that becomes a lot more difficult. And that does require quite a bit of investment in standardization, in, standard, in backbone, in data sharing, in infrastructure. So the full potential, the full value of all of this would only come when we actually get the information base uh, availability uh, in place. And then we unlock the potential of also advanced analytics, which can only function when we have very good, reliable information to base these algorithms and intelligence on. So what we showed in the context of Sweden is that if we were to do nothing and we would let healthcare costs increase at the current historic trajectory, not assuming that it's going to be more expensive in the future, not assuming that's going to be more demand, but actually just going the rate we've been going for the past 30 years, we would end up almost doubling the healthcare expenditure in real kroner by 2030. But if we apply all of these known technologies that we know work, we can actually lower the unit cost by 25% and save this 180 billion Swedish kroners. That can and should probably be partly reinvested in healthcare or partly spent on something else that's valuable for society. But as you can see, it's a bit of a different curve, but um, the lowest curve there, it's, it's not dipping down. We're not firing doctors or nurses or healthcare professionals. They're probably all going to be needed in the future. They're just going to be able to focus on the work that's most value-adding and not on unnecessary administration. They're going to be able to see many more patients, the patients that will need them as our population is aging, as we have more challenging things that we need to address. We can start curing MS. We don't have to treat it, we can cure it, but it's costly. So reinvesting that money and saving where it's easy to save, such as web bookings, digital consultations, and other things. Just as an interest and to engage you, how many of you have had what's m maybe the easiest available thing, a digital consultation. So, met with a physician or a nurse online, either by video or by chat, in the last 12 months. Really big show of hand. So, every tenth person maybe, 10% roughly. Yeah, it's, and, and we are the innovators. It could be many, many more. If you look at systems that have implemented it fully out, like Kaiser Permanente, etc., um, we're talking about 40, 50, 60% digital meets. And it doesn't need to be a doctor face to face, it can be um, over chat, over email, etc. I had a digital experience. My, uh, I was told I have a six month old daughter, 
she had her first eye infection. And um, I was very, very hesitant of taking her to the doctor because it was snowing outside, I was lazy, I was thinking maybe it's not necessary. But then it occurred to me that I should do the things that I'm preaching, so therefore I did a drop-in consultation with a doctor. Uh, immediately got a response from a pediatric doctor situated somewhere in the south of Sweden who did a knee prescription for a, an ointment for my little daughter's eye, which we managed to pick up later in the day. And the whole thing was an experience which took two minutes, saved me a lot of hassle um, and, and really worked well. And I'm convinced, but the society is not convinced. And then the next day I had lunch with some very important decision makers in uh, Stockholm. And they were saying, yes, this company that gave me this fantastic service um, that I was so happy with, they're accused of two things. One, they're accused of uh, increasing antibiotic prescriptions above what's natural, because that's how they're being paid. So they need to always, you know, Get a get a prescription out there because that's how they they get they get their money from the county council. The other thing they're accused of is that this is a private provider using staff from all over Sweden, primarily staff in the south, but the people that use their services are from the Stockholm area, people like me, and they're basically going to bankrupt the Stockholm County Council, which has a very very large budget, within the next few years. So, I ponder a little bit over this situation and wonder if either of these claims are true. Antibiotic prescription, they assure me, I know the founders, that they don't do more than the average uh, ward central, so let's believe that. That can be also stopped and researched. Um, bankrupting Stockholm County Council? Mm, maybe. Um, we need to change as a society. These players force us to change. And that brings me to the final point, which is what do we need to do as a system to make this work? Because we have great companies out there that provide services that we as patients and consumers really want to enjoy, but at the same time, as a society, as a medical system, we tend to put a lot of things in their way or even if we don't do harm directly, we might not support them enough so that they can actually thrive and become the medical expert, the innovation expert we're hoping that these companies could become. But that's also something we need to understand, that we are in a unique position in Finland, in Scandinavia, that we have so many things in place that other countries are incredibly jealous of us for having. For example, we do have an ambition. Most people out there do acknowledge that there is value in digital healthcare. Providers see it as a natural development and want to do it. We might need a more coordinated effort to make it happen quicker, but the ambition is there. We have great infrastructure, we have laws for data security. Uh, we can build on this infrastructure and we can make it safe. We have the ID, ID, unique identifier, which is lacking in several countries. It's very hard to bring medical records online available for everybody. We have that. And um, we need to take it one step further, whichever way it's best to do, to actually make that data, that information available to everybody in the care chain as well as the patient themselves. We have some legal and privacy issue laws that we need to overcome. And very important, the financing and compensation has been the same way in healthcare for years, which is why this little startup is looking to bankrupt the Stockholm County Council, potentially, is because they are being paid astronomical si sums, fee for service for their visits, um, much more than it costs. Uh, we need to align those incentives, we need to find a new way of financing the healthcare system, we need to move more financing to preventive care and primary care, away from the acute hospital care, which we are actually saving massive amounts of money in, uh, if we do the digital tools that are available. 
And of course, we need to spread the word. So I'm more than happy to talk to you about this, about the analysis, about the uh, work itself and comparable things in, in, in Finland, which is my home country and I visit quite a lot. Um, there is a report. I think my colleagues put them out on the tables back there. There is a smaller report. If you don't want to read all the word, you can read um, just a little leaflet. And more than happy to take questions. <laughs>